La Romántica, for example, is snobbish on the part of uh, the Palma. Uh, because there was a long tradition of satire, uh, and the satire basically denounces uh, eccentric, extravagant characters. Uh, I think that uh, it has to do with whatever goes out of social order, but it's not perceived necessarily as um, uh, part of a, of, a, of, a, of a dynamics of snobbery in the sense that for the Palma, he doesn't, I don't think he sees that Romantica is, or at least he doesn't give her credit for wanting to be uh, ahead of her time. He just thinks she's um, not decent enough, too crazy. He's not saying, well, she's, uh, uh, you know, she's announcing what's going to happen now in, in a few years. And that's what starts happening more when, uh, you know, being uh, in touch with, uh, with the new becomes more and more legitimate in terms of fashion, of writing. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, that's the context of romanticism. And, um, and in that sense, uh, it's the, the writing of the Palma and other, uh, other Cuban writers in that moment is very contradictory. Because on the one hand, they're interested in romanticism. On the other hand, they're constantly denouncing the excesses, the excesses that were produced by it. For example, in this uh, young lady who you know, lacks all sense of uh, prudencia, right, or of measure. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he is, he is, and, and he's not. Um, it's the, the this question of being a farsante is central there, and I think you're right. Uh, let me clarify that the examples I gave were, how would you call them, um, always from a certain perspective. I, I wasn't describing the essential of Darío. I was just describing the Darío. Uh, addressed to by this particular character. Actually, the Ariba Modernistas in general were and still are generally denounced as, you know, people whose work was totally derivative, farsantes, 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think your comment um, helps me clarify even that even further because it, it also changes throughout time, right? The way they are looked at. And uh, if you look at the criticism, for example, on Ruben Darío, you have a lot of critics writing articles in the last decades, you know, uh, criticizing other critics for criticizing Darío for being, uh, you know, too French, basically, right? So um, that's, that's important. But once again, like, it's interesting, this, this relational thing, even though we understand how it works, uh, makes the task of understanding snobbery very, very difficult. Because you're, you're never a snob, essentially, right? It's, it's always uh, uh, according to someone else or in a certain context. I mean, think, I mean, ask, do this exercise, which I have done while writing this talk. Like, Try to find moments in which you're a snob. I don't think I'm a snob person, but I have discovered many moments in which I'm saying things just because I, it's, it's, it's a snob thing to say. It's general situations of stress, right? You feel like threatened. You have to, you know, show your authority or things like that. Um, I think Virginia Woolf really has the point when she describes snobbing this as this tension between, you know, showing off and not being sure of who you are really. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah. Well, um, thank Victor for his talk and <laughs> Take away 
expropriate um, the land and then only then um, deal with the, the defense. So that in a famous movie, um, Land and Freedom is uh, showing talking about the issue, but it's very well. Which we're going to show here next, uh, around May Day next, which is spring. So I'm done, and if you want me to put that, do you want to run do this you want to, Sure. You can skip it and you can watch it, as much as you want, um, you know. Okay, sure. And I need to start talking. I stopped talking. I handed up two or three names to each of the other officers and they went up in police panels with several guards. And finally, there was just one man left in the corner there, band number 17. Band 17 is the last to succumb at three in the morning. Nobody knows who was on its list for arrest. All that is clear is that a van arrived at the home of the leader of the opposition, the right wing of Jose Calvo Sotelo. They asked him to step down to the station for questioning. He promised to telephone soon to his family. Unless, he added, these gentlemen blow my brains out. Opposition had been assassinated in the custody of the government's own special police. The Calvo Sotero murder brought the fury of conservative Spanish to its peak. Its timing, a malign coincidence, offered the army plot mass support at a crucial moment. Entonces, todas las dudas y vacilaciones que aún existían. then, but all the doubts, hesitations, about whether to call the uprising immediately or to wait for the disintegration to spread so that we would be more justified. All those doubts disappeared. Within hours of the murder, Mother dispatched a coded telegram. It read, On the 15th last at 4 a.m., Helen gave birth to a beautiful child. Hidden here with a date, Time and place of the uprising. Mola was the July 18th, General Mola. Mola. in Morocco. The Republican government knew that Spain was close to explosion, but it failed to take seriously the approaching spark, the military uprising. The left knew all too well what was coming, and the workers were already garrisoning party and trade union offices. At midnight, the socialist leader, Idelethio Prieto, 
with some of his colleagues, met the Prime Minister, Casares Quiroga. They begged him to arm the people, but Casares thought this would fling away the last hopes of law and order. He refused. At dawn on July 14th, Captain Baird took off from Casablanca. Destination, the Canary Islands. That same morning, the funerals of Castillo and Cabo Sotelo took place. Clenched fist for Castillo's coffin. And spent our fascist salute for Cabo Sotelo. What remained of political middle ground in Spain was crumbling. Disaster now seemed inevitable. Juan Molina was an anarchist militant in Barcelona. The hadn't slept at home for several nights. We were grabbing what sleep we could on floors of the Union in our newspaper offices. We were waiting for the inevitable. In our newspapers, we were telling our members to be prepared. Everybody was ready because we knew the coup was bound to come. Josep Taladez, the Catalan leader, called on a prime minister, but Casares Quiroga still refused to see what was about to happen. While we were chatting, news arrived of army unrest in Morocco. There were reports that some generals were about to rise, although General Franco's name still wasn't being mentioned. So then I told him, my friend Casares, I'm convinced that the army is going to rise against Spanish democracy. He said, I'm sure it won't. <laughs> Casares Quiroga could not believe the generals would go so far. But on July 17th, the day before it was planned, the rising erupted here in Malia. Next day, it spread to other towns in Morocco, even before General Franco had arrived to lead the army of Africa. The military plotters assumed that their coup d'etat would succeed swiftly. The government of the Republic, in turn, thought it was strong enough to stamp out this erratic rising. Both were terribly wrong. The rising spread to the mainland, and the rebel generals soon controlled great tracts of the countryside. But the workers were now at last given arms. And with loyal police units, they defeated the military in most of Spain's industrial cities. There could be no rapid victory either way. The rising swelled into full-blown counter-revolution. <laughs>